Recording in progress. All right, so um, I want you to turn to Amos chapter 5 and verse 24. Uh, what I'm going to do is probably follow this pattern of I'm going to hit the highlighted verse for each of the chapters. Um, Amos 5.24 says, but let justice roll out like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. This is kind of the key verse of Amos, as we'll see when we get here. We'll walk through it today. Again, we're kind of going in summary fashion along amongst many of the minor prophets. Um, we'll, we'll, as we get to it, we'll... Uh, um, you recall that uh, as we took a look last week at the uh, the Torah, Nevaim, and the Ketuvim, that this is the, would have been the way that the Old Testament was arranged. And we find ourselves in the, the, the 12, so right in the middle of the bottom, we're into the 12, the minor prophets. We're all on one scroll. Uh, so small were they. And so um, we're going to take a look at that. Uh, we've, we, again, looked at this a little bit last week, but we're looking at this section of the Old Testament. And this kind of informs really the rest of the New Testament. And we took, look, took a look again at a number of those pieces last week. Um, what I want to do is just give you a slight overview of um, all the 12 prophets. And this is my understanding. There are a few decisions to be made. Some people are, some of the prophets are what are called, they're either a late date or an early date. And there's some question as to which one they really are. Um, Joel, we looked at last week, is one of those. I think it's an, a later date, not an early date. Uh, by, the, by that I mean, by that I mean, sometimes people put Joel in the eighth century, and just given uh, what we see there, I don't think so. I think Joel is probably one of the later prophets, along with Malachi. Uh, but we're looking at Hosea, and then to, we looked at Hosea a year ago, and now we're looking at Amos, and we'll look at Obadiah next week. And I'll give you, give you a slide for that next week. But it kind of gives you an idea of where they are. Um, all right, so let's let's go on to the next slide. One of the things I want you to understand as we get into, into Amos is how the prophets are being prophesied, or the, how the nations are being prophesied as we get into it. Um, the judgment of the nations. So if you look up in the upper right-hand side, you have the kingdom of Ram, and the capital of that was Damascus. I'm going to be here a little while, so don't rush. Uh, you can rush if you want, but I'm going to be here a little while. <laughs> um, but you have the, the, the nation of Aram, and we're, we're prophesying against Damascus. And so you find that up in the upper upper right-hand corner, right? Cross down completely down to the lower left-hand corner, and you have Gaza, or which is the first town that's, that's prophesied against there, into the country of Philistia. So uh, um, let's see, Aram to Philistia, and then we go straight up north to Phoenicia and Tyre, and then down to Edom. What have I just done with the first four nations? Aram, Philistia, Phoenician, and Edom. Take out your hand, use your right or left, either one, and, and crisscross or go from, follow each of the nations from Aram to Phoenicia, up to Aram to Philistia, up to Phoenicia, down to Edom. What have I just done? Big axe. A big X. And I don't think that's accidental. In, in terms of the geography, Amos is laying out how he's taking care of all the nations. And then he takes care of Ammon and Moab. Every nation that surrounds him, he, God has, through Amos, then essentially done a big X on, and judgment across all the nations. And I don't think that's accidental. Um, so you can, you can take that for what it's worth. Uh, but I, I thought a, a geography lesson might be, might be good today. All right, so what I want to do is give you from there, um, what is the key, the outline here? So we're going to look at chapters one and two, where the eight nations are judged. And by eight nations, we're looking at, let's see if you can just, can you name the eight nations? Aram. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Felicia. Phoenicia. Phoenicia. Edom. Ammon. Moab. Judah. And Israel. Right? Those are the eight nations. Aram. Philistia. Phoenicia. Edom. A Ammon and Moab, and then Judah and Israel. Eight nations are going to be judged in these two chapters. Uh, and of course, with that, the six Gentile nations and two Jewish, na Jewish nations. In chapters three through six, there are three messages that we'll give. Uh, first, that Israel's judgment is certain. The second, that Israel's sins are denounced. And that Israel's doom is lamented. Now, given that it took me eight weeks to go through the... Um, War the armor of God. How are we going to make it 
one week in, <laughs> yeah, you watch. All right, and then finally, the, the last part is chapter seven through nine, five visions of judgment from the locusts, the fire, the plumb line. There's a little bit of a historical interlude that happens of Amos being described as, as going to, uh, to Bethel. And then finally, the basket of summer fruit and the ruined temple. And then finally, this glorious talk of what happens when the nation's restored. And one of the things that we find in almost all of the minor prophets is this aspect of judgment's coming. And you better beware. And the fact you have all eight of those nations in this small area, meaning that judgment's coming for everybody if they don't repent. But with well, the concluding verse, and even inside the chapter, in, inside the book itself, there's this, there's this overriding theme of if repentance happens, God relents of that judgment and that wrath. And that's the kind of God God is. All right. So let me stop there. Any, any questions? All right, we're going to uh, go back to the beginning again. So we'll uh, um, we'll pick up with this uh, this section. All right, so just kind of a way of introduction then. Amos prophesied to Israel during the reigns of Uzziah and Jeroboam II when both kingdoms enjoyed peace and prosperity. And they were unequaled in the, since the reign of Solomon. Um, and Jeroboam will become important later on as we talk about the cows of Bashan. Despite its healthy appearance, though, Israel was in an advanced state of decay. Uh, socially, morally, religiously, Jeroboam did evil in the sight of Yahweh and continued in idolatry. Uzziah, though a good king, failed to remove the high places. So he went partway, but not all the way. So the prophet Amos raised his voice in protest against the religious and the moral corruption during the day. And he warned of national judgment on those refusing to change their ways. This just kind of an overall view of the whole thing. The sins condemned by Amos included exploitation and oppression of the poor and the needy, corrupt and degenerate religious and judicial practices, excessive indulgence, um, and general disregard for the laws of God. And every nation is condemned in this respect. In dealing with the sins of Israelite society, as we go from, it's, it's understandable that the Gentile nations wouldn't be following God. And yet there's some familial allegiance that each of these nations has because they can all trace back their descendant of, of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob can trace all their, you can trace all the nations around there and their lineage back to descend, being the descendant of Abraham. Uh, in dealing with the sins of Israelite society, Amos warned of impending judgment, but he also called the people to repentance. And Amos insisted that true religion and biblical morality are inseparable. If you're religious, you will be moral. Isn't that what the book of James is about too? This is not a new theme that comes, James suddenly, you know, arose. Not only is James a commentary, if you will, on the Sermon on the Mount, that's a study for another day, but James is a commentary upon the Old Testament as well, that when we are touched by God, when he gets inside and he, he, he performs a radical transformation of our heart, our lives change as a result. And that's, if we're not changed, it's an evidence that we might not be changed from the inside out. Amos insisted that they're inseparable. And of course, we find that in James again. He, he called the people to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like ever flowing streams. That's why chapter five, verse 24 is really the key verse is that our lives should change and justice and doing away with oppression and bringing justice um, ought to be known by, of every believer. In an ethical sense, righteousness refers to what conforms to the divine standards of God. It's in its um, the righteousness per, the righteous person recognizes God's standard, treats others equally before the law, and Amos himself appealed for people to let these two qualities characterize their dealings with God and other individuals. Only then would society function according to the divine plan or the divine norm. So that's kind of an overview of Amos. You get an idea that oppression, justice, um, even dignity um, are going to be inherent in there. And we're going to look at, at the chapters in not great detail, but a little bit more detail. So we're going to start in chapter one and two. Um, so in chapter one, uh, starting at verses uh, verses two, you know, again, we read about Amos, uh, who among the sheep herders from Tekoa, in which he saw visions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And so what happens is, as we as you read each of these, 
You go from, uh, again, Aram down to Gaza, down to Tyre, down to, I forget what uh, Edom is, but the, you know, down to the countries of uh, Aram, Philist uh, Philistia, Phoenicia, Edom, Moab, or Aram, Ammon, Moab. And there's a, there's a simple formula that he follows, and there's there's five distinct things that go on. And we'll look in detail with Damascus just to follow that. But the same pattern happens to each of these, these cities. The first one, as we read this in verse 2, and he said, that is, and God said, the Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he utters his voice, and the shepherds' pastures grounds mourn, and the summit of Carmel dries up. This is what the Lord says for the three offenses of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. But because they threshed Gilead with iron sledges, so I will send fire upon the house of Hazael, and it will consume the citadels of Ben-Hadad. I will also break the gate bar of Damascus, and I eliminate every inhabitant from the valley of Avon, as well as him who holds the scepter from Beth Eden. So the people of Aram will be exiled to Kerr, says the Lord. Now, again, we'll leave the others for a little bit later. But the first thing that happens is this is what the Lord says. Amos is God's messenger here. Again, he's moved from Tekoa, the south of Jerusalem, into the heart of, um, of Israel, what would be called later on Samaria. And here he was, just a sheep herder from Tekoa, um, a small village. Uh, Amos essentially had an international role in condemning all the nations around him even from his perch in Samaria. But he had an international role in proclaiming God's judgment on the nations of Judah because he was sent as God's ambassador. So the first thing is that this is what the Lord says. This is not what Amos says. He's not, you know, he's not a social prophet necessarily, though he is highlighting the social ills. And so he's bringing this idea of, um, this is what the Lord says and he, what he's given to me to say. The second thing is that there's certain judgment he says, for the offenses of the sons of the sins of X and for four. Three would represent fullness. Um, I had a, a, a manager one time back at the bank um, who, when you wrote a, when you created a PowerPoint deck, it had to have odd number of bullet points. It was either one or three or five or seven. It was never two or four. Just the way he was. It just He had to have an odd number. Uh, and there's just some superstition that he had. Um, and so you find this idea even here of three is a number of completeness in terms of finding, let's say, the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is not an Old Testament concept, but even in our world, we want we like threes, things that are kind of odd numbered that you can grab a hold of and make sure that they characterize us. Three would be the number of fullness. So if three is the number of fullness, what happens when we go to four? We're spilling over. And that's the nature of what Amos is trying to describe here. For three sins of the sons of X. Yea, for four. And so what seems to be the fourth sin for each of the nations is listed is the straw which breaks the camel's back each of those times. The word offenses in the New American Standard uh, indicates transgressions or rebellions and crimes or sins. And it's one of the three key words in the Old Testament about sin. Um, and it represents each of the nations that had rebelled against God. And why do we say that they rebelled against God if they don't know God necessarily? because they can trace their lineage back to Abraham at some point in time. So identification of one specific sin, um, back to Damascus, uh, you find in, uh, where'd it go? Uh, verse three, this is what the Lord says, for the three defense offenses of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke its punishment because they threshed Gilead with iron sledges. Now the New American Standard uh, and I'm sorry, the Septuagint actually adds a phrase to this. Don't know quite where the source of that is, but they actually add, you know, for the slaying of the pregnant woman in Gilead. And it, it, you find that uh, Gilead is, everybody know where Gilead? Gilead's to the north of, of Israel, where really we're um, from Mount Hermon, that's Bashan. Uh, Gilead's up to the north end, north and the east of, of Israel. And it was a popular place because it is nice and a gentle place, you know, pros prosperous and fertile. And yet everybody wanted that territory for land grab. Think of 1967 and the uh, Israeli, uh, Israeli war. 
Um, this is the area that was grabbed by Israel when um, Jordan was conquered, um, when Jordan was defeated. And so that is that area there. Um, so first one is, this is what the Lord says. Second, a little certain judgment and because of this offense. And the second, or the third thing is the identification of one specific sin. This is not to uh, indicate that every nation with whom God was angry had just four sins. Again, this is just the sin that breaks the camel's back, if you will. This is the sin for which they are fed up. And by following this re repetitive formula, the subject of the repetition gets the attention. So here's the fourth thing, is that there's an oracle of God's, God's judgment, a proclamation by Amos of God's judgment. God is not sending um, another to accomplish his wrath. God himself is sending the agent to do the wrath. It may be God himself who's executing the fire or the tearing down of the citadels, but it is God himself who's doing it. He may use another agent to do it, but God is the one who's executing it. He's saying himself, I will send, I will break, I will destroy. God's taking not only, not just ownership and tacit uh, or implicit idea of, yeah, I knew, I knew it was coming. I let it happen. God is causing it to happen because he's, his wrath is filled. So three, th four things so far. This is what the Lord says for certain offenses, identification of one specific sin, that fourth, usually the fourth sin, the oracle of God's judgment, and then finally, the aspect of removal. In Damascus, the nation of Aram was to the northeast. This really was one of Israel's most persistent um, nations. Let me, let me just go back there a second, that, that picture. All right. Aram was their, one of their most persistent enemies, um, the Arameans. Um, it was conquered by David, and yet they broke free under Solomon. Um, they were brutal in their treatment of the Gileadites. Um, and again, the Septuagint says that they performed brutality against the pregnant women. And we'll see that again in Ammon later on. God uses Assyria and fire um, to, in order to punish them. And then the fact that he says they're removed to Kerr, what we'll find out later in the book, if I control my time, rather than my time controlling me, um, is that they were actually came from Kerr. So they're being sent back to the place where they came from. Kind of an echo of from the dust you came to the dust you'll return. Um, so that's, that's what happened with Damascus. They're, again, they're brutal. They're un, unflinching. They're, God's judgment is filled up against them, and they're going to be sent back from whence they came by fire and by the nation of Assyria. Gaza, which is, again, the next prophecy. We'll just highlight this in, a, in just a few sentences. Gaza is to the southwest. Uh, we're present day about where the Gaza Strip is. Not exactly, but you know, very close. The sin of the Philistia was the enslavement of people and selling them to Edom. There was no dignity, no idea. These were people who are likewise made in the image of God. They were people who were enslaved and then sent off to be slaves someplace else. God sends fire. Uh, one commentary says that fire in these passages represents God's holy wrath, if you will. Every citizen of Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Ekron are to be eliminated. The only, the only town that's left is the town of Gath. That's not mentioned here at all. Um, one of the things, you know, just complete aside, but one of the things, if you go to Israel, one of the things that strikes you is that how close everything is. You get to the town of Azekah that overlooks the Valley of Elah, where the Battle of David and Goliath occurred. And you, one, you're staring at it, and it's you know, less than a mile away. And as you look, you, you go over, to, that's on the east side of Azekah, which is on top of a hill. You go over to the west side, and you're, they're staring at you five miles away as gas. They're just, you could leave for, leave for breakfast, you know, have a nice day, hon. Go off to war, come back, and how was your day? <laughs> and you'd be, and it would, it'd be fine. It's just not that far away. Um, but here you have people, again, in Gaza, near the entire, nearly the entire population of Gaza is about to be eliminated unless they repent. Um, Tyre, uh, which includes Phoenicia, they were involved in the slave, slave trade as well, and fire happened to them. But what happened also to them is that they, they had their protection removed from them. We sang this morning about a, a, a finding safety in a small, in our, in our, a small tower. Uh, and I think I showed a picture of this a few, few weeks ago. Uh, a place where you could escape to in a in a field, and in in a place where your enemy was only five miles away, these were fields where these towers were somewhat necessary. And what what God's referring to in terms of having their their citadels broken down or their walls broken down is that God's removing the towers 
and God's removing the walls of the city to make the cities completely accessible to the invaders. There's going to be no protection whatsoever. And the thing which I thought I had prepared for, like, like preparing for your own 401k, um, you find out that that's inadequate because God has taken it away. And so they have no protection. They have nobody to call on but God himself for protection now. Uh, we get to Edom. Um, again, there was a forgotten shared covenant with the descendants of Isaac, specifically uh, Israel. Um, they were pursued with a broadsword. Um, if, again, we, we're not reading it necessarily, but as you walk through here, one well, of the commands is that God's going to come against with them with a sword. And again, the, the Septuagint lends the idea that it's a broadsword. It's a sword meant for not cutting and stabbing, not stabbing and slicing, but for massive cutting, like losing of limbs and heads and all sorts of other appendages. It was not meant for, it was meant for brutal, um, um, there's a word I can think of, but I can't. It's right on the tip of, right on the tip of my tongue. That's right. It was, amputations was a wonderful side effect of a broadsword. Yeah, it was meant. It was meant to cut things off. Uh, mm -hmm. It was meant to be brutal about how you did it as well. But um, um, that's that's Edom. So uh, they were pursued with the broadsword with and with warfare and their destructive fire and removed protection. Fire, by the way, if you go to Israel, is one of those things that helps you identify when things actually occurred. Um, when you go to, to the, the town of uh, Jericho, you know, the, uh, the fire layer is part of what helps you understand when the walls went down and things went on fire. Everything that was around there, from crops to oil or everything else was stored, um, those things tended to stay there. They, they tended to abandon a fire um, fireplace. Or if you go to Hadzor up in the north, uh, you see this fire layer, and, and everything that's stored at that layer gives you an idea of when this actually occurred. So fire is really a helpful indicator when you're doing archaeology. Um, but it's God's marker that He's also been there, and fire is how they got their fire is how they got their um, head 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 into them with head attached, and how their God removed their protection. We move to Ammon um, again. God or the Ammonites had ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead, and this act terrorized the people. Uh, psychologically, but also reduce the population physically. What happens when you don't have any children being born? Like in Japan or China today, your birth rate goes down to near zero if you don't have any babies being born, which means that the population doesn't recur and regenerate itself. And we've now lost our ability to do our cultural mandate of filling, ruling, subduing, filling, multiplying, ruling, subduing. If we have no children coming after us, there's no way to pick up the gauntlet. And so it, it terrorized people. Um, and they did it not even because they had anything against the people of Gilead, they just wanted their land. And so they, that's the way they inhabited it. So again, God's judgment is more fire plus warfare, plus the coming of nature and storms. Um, how many of you have lived through a tornado? Just a few of you. Oh, joy. <laughs> Four. It's not a pleasant experience, is it? If you've been through one. It's a scary experience. Um, if you've been through a hurricane, you may have been through a hurricane. Yeah. Um, and you say live through it. How many miles have you got? <laughs> how many miles? How away? many miles away? Uh, two of them different. were directly over my house. Like that. Uh, uh, well, I uh, so the house we lived in, the first one was the house we lived in was the highest house in the town. Uh, it was on the it was a it was a three story house on top of the highest hill in the town, and. <laughs> and it's, it's my dad loved the Cubs, which kind of explains things for me. <laughs> I do not like the Cubs, um, but my dad loved the Cubs. And so he put not only on this three story, not only had this three story house, but he put another foot and a, or a story and a half antenna on top of that so we could get WGN <laughs> <laughs> so we could watch the Cubs. Uh, I kid you not, it, he, he loved the Cubs. My best day was when he took me to see the Philadelphia Phillies to watch the Cubs and um, the Philadelphia Phillies came behind in the seventh inning and, uh, and beat the Cubs, who were ahead seven to nothing. And the Phillies won that day, 11 to seven. Yes. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Any other comments about what I threw the tornado? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. 
No, married to a Cardinals fan, I think he would appreciate my my dilemma and, and reveling in somebody else's pain and, and misery, which seems to follow the Cubs everywhere we go. But that's another story for another day. So back to the in the whole in the in the house, um, the the tornado course usually comes from the southwest or the west, and the tornado coming that way, the the um, the chimney blew off, was the chimney was taken off, and it was right in the middle of the building, but there were dents two stories up from the bricks on the west side of the building. So the, the bricks traveled from the center around and hit the side of the, of the building we were in. And then the building crashed, literally at the moment I got down to the basement, um, trying to, to escape it all. Um, the antenna um, blew to the south, and then the, the tree that was um, about 30 feet from the house um, fell over my truck that my dad had just gotten that week. Um, and that blew off to the east. So you had you had pieces just within this one lot, uh, you know, two blocks away, houses were ripped off, or the roofs were ripped off. Um, the tornado is a very scary thing. And, uh, and and you find all this noise. And and when the noise comes, the walls shake. And that's what got my attention. I was listening to a, a uh, on my, my cassette player, I was listening to the soundtrack of Shaft, of, <laughs> soundtrack of Shaft, if I remember right. And... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's, which is a story for another day, probably maybe another day, another year. Um, but anyway, listening to those again with my headphones on, with this, and my dad is downstairs at the bottom stairs screaming at the top of the only time I ever heard my dad yell and screaming for me to get down in the basement because it was coming, it was coming bad, and because the whole building was shaking. That's what caught my attention was was not so much that, but anyway. Storms are very scary things, and that's just tornadoes, let alone hurricanes, which occupies it for. The straight, the longer, more wind for a longer period of time. I, God can stir up some very scary, stir up some very scary things to us. And what He's doing is using those storms against the nations, because they terrorize the nations and they make you feel very, very small when they occur. The really bizarre part is you, it all passes over, and while the temperature may drop, there's absolutely not a cloud in the sky three hours later. You can see, you can see every star imaginable. It's just amazing. So anyway, back to Ammon. Um, the storms and the reduction of their fortresses, all their wall protection, everything they trusted in is gone. And then finally, Moab, where the, they burned the bones of the king of Edom to lie. Now, the idea here was that they, it wasn't just that they, they he died and they, they burned him alive, or they burned him, but they exhumed his body in order to burn it. Uh, um, they, they burned his body to ash. They desecrated the body of the king. You want fire? God says, I'll give you fire. And so he punished them with the same fire. So again, that's chapters one and two, uh, a little bit longer than I anticipated, uh, given my, dis my discourse on, on the Chicago Cubs. But you begin to see that God has some things stored up in his wrath against the nations. And at some point in time, God's wrath doesn't relent with his, to his compassion. God's wrath gets fulfilled because people refuse to repent. And that's what's the story of Amos. So we move on to chapters um, two through, uh, we'll move on to chapter two. Um, and Judah is condemned, in, let me go back to my outline here. In chapter two, uh, Judah is condemned. And just a few, few short verses. Uh, the, the Judah, of course, is the southern tribe, two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. They rejected the law of the Lord and by extension of the Lord himself. And they failed to keep the decrees and they followed the same lies and idolatry as did their ancestors. All of this is a breach of the covenant with God. So God uses fire to destroy the nation and decimate their self-made protection. Now, amongst the outlying parts, when, when um, David and, and Solomon built protection, they had these ring of, um, of uh, fortresses that outlined, this was called the Shvela. They outlined the outer edges, and you only could get to Jerusalem by going on these, past these outer edges. So these fortresses were very well situated to understand anything that's coming by them. And when Babylon was invading, I think you, you talk about, I think a report from Lachish said, you know, the fires of Azekah are gone. They could see there was line of sight from one fortress to another fortress, and they had an idea that things are okay or things are not okay. And they knew within the signal light or the fire that was in Ezekiel that they could see as gone, they knew that were, the nation was being invaded. But there's nothing they could do. 
who are being completely overrun. Now, this is uh, before that. This is 100 years before that. But the same idea happens is that when the protection goes, it certain, sends a certain signal across the whole nation of, uh-oh, is about the minimum level of things it sends. Of, uh uh-oh, we're being invaded and there's not a whole lot we can do because our protection is completely gone. And along with Hosea, remember Hosea was, um, where, did, where did the nation flee to protection when it looked like Assyria was going to invade uh, the nation when Hosea was prophesying? Huh? Syria. Syria and Assyria. The very nation that was, a, was invading them, they went and said, hey, can you protect us? Except you're looking to invade us. And Assyria pretty much went and said, yeah, they're weak. <laughs> That's not a, that's a dumb idea. God, God was a little bit miffed that they didn't go to God for protection against Syria. They actually ran away from God and into Assyria's arms. And Judah somewhat does the same thing here. In verses two, uh, chapter two, verses six to 16, you have Israel now being condemned. And this is the long diatribe. Um, as I pointed out in the introduction, Amos leaves his home in Judah and travels to the northern 10 tribes um, to prophesy against them. And given this, it shouldn't surprise that as long as list of sins is against the fellow descendants of Abraham and Isaac, that they should be so detailed. The length of his details that Israel is actually the chief target of God's wrath here. In other words, we go from the six um, Gentile nations, past Judah, right to the sins of Israel. And Israel, we have this long list of sins that's there. Israel seems to be the key target in Amos altogether. Their sins, well, first of all, was oppression. They impoverished righteous and needy people, selling them into slavery for money. Second, the judges were corrupt. And third, the people were engaging in incest and without any remorse whatsoever. Verse 7 indicates that it was uh, verse uh, chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, Those who trample the head of the helpless to the dust of the earth and divert the way of the humble and a man and his father resort to the same girl so as to profane my holy name. In other words, they did it just to thumb their nose at God. They did it just to poke God in the eye. It, would, it wasn't that they enjoyed it necessarily, but they enjoyed mocking God. Um, along with that, the forced individuals who had taken a Nazareth, they forced individuals who had taken a Nazarite vow, they forced them to drink wine in order to break their vow. And they prohibited the prophets from prophesying. There was to be no spiritual effort in this place except the effort that we approve of. So God rehearses his faithfulness in order to contrast with their faithlessness in the chapter. In turn, God rolls over the nation, as you will, as he says, as as something comes underneath a, 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 a wheel of a chariot, something creating a rut. Their safe places are removed, their strength is taken away. The warriors are incapable of defending themselves. Proud and arrogant, the nation slinks away in weakness and shame. So what do we, just as these first two chapters roll through us, the, just a couple of things that we're supposed to gain from this. And, and there's really, these are the big ticket items, so to speak. God is sovereign over all the nations. God is the one who will not be mocked. God is the one who has the power to restore his name and his reputation. And he has sovereignty over them all. And, but, and that also that God is tolerant but that tolerance doesn't last forever. God is compassionate, as we see in Exodus uh, chapter 37, as God reveals himself to Moses, right? When he, he names who he is and what he does. And we find out that he's compassionate, slow to anger, loving, showing loving kindness. But that show doesn't last forever. There, are, there will be times, and there have been times, when his wrath is full with three things, yet four, and his wrath spills over. And they're meant to catch the idea that they may be protected by a covenant, the covenant of Abraham, but that will not protect them at all forever. God is tolerant, but not forever. And we'll see that more as we get into the rest of the chapter. Um, So section, second section is, you know, we look within and see the corruption. So again, message, message to uh, Israel in, in terms of their judgment being certain, that their sins are announced and their doom lamented. Again, chapters three through six are all to Israel. Not to Judah, not to the other six nations, just to Israel. So is Israel's privilege, um, we'll turn to chapter three and verse three, uh, back to verse two. 
You ha only have I known among the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your wrongdoing. Do people, do two people walk together unless they have agreed to meet? Does a lion roar on the street when he has no prey? Does a young lion growl from his den unless he's captured something? The aspect of, of chapter three, verse three, do people, do people, two people go to walk together unless they've agreed to meet? You know, when we have a covenant, we've agreed on what our priorities are. Here's the outline of the covenant. You agree to these conditions and understanding that there will be blessings if you follow them and curses if you don't with the old, the old covenant. And they had not followed the covenant. So what, what can we nationally expect but curses? And so he's saying, we agreed at one time, but by your actions now, we see that you don't agree and we can't walk together anymore. And so God judges the nation. Uh, Israel, Israel's privilege of being elected because they were chosen out of, they weren't chosen from any benefit. They weren't any better or, or worse than anybody else. They were just chosen, said, Abraham, you're, you're my guy. I'm going to bless all the nations through you. And so um, they were chosen from all the families of the earth. And in their arrogance, they actually denied the faithfulness of God. They stopped looking to God to say, God will help us. God will show us and shine his light upon us. They said, we'll take care of ourselves. We don't need you. A very famous off-quoted uh, verse, again, is chapter 3, verse 3. Do two people walk together unless they have agreed to meet? And God said, we're done with that at this point. Violating the covenant, turning their back on God's election and choice of them, of all the nations, guaranteed that when they walked away and when they turned back on, when they turned their back on God, there were consequences. And this is a fur further fulfillment of the prophecy of Joshua that the nation wouldn't be able to keep the covenant. Do you remember what it was that Joshua said when, in this scenario? As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. The nation said, yeah, us too. And Joshua went, I don't think so. That's my interpretation. That's the... Uh... All right, so that's chapter three. But you see this beginning of the condemnation of Israel. In chapter 4, verses 1 to 13, you read about the cows of Bashan. Um, hear, this, you, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, or Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria. What's he talking about cows of Bashan? First of all, Bashan is an area where today, Syria and Israel and Jordan all meet. Um, it's a plateau. It's 2,000 feet above sea level, and it stretches from Mount Hermon to the north, um, clear down to the Golan Heights, which you hear about today from time to time. The regions receive an av above average amount of rainfall. So the, the soil is very rich and it's rich for crops to feed livestock. And the reference to cows actually, ref now if I said bulls, you know which was it, the males or the females if I said bulls? Yeah, okay. So if he's talking about cows, what's he talking about here? Females, all right. I just don't want you to make, think I'm jumping to conclusions. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> no, it's, the, the area was rich. It was where people went. And when Jeroboam grabbed land and went into the area, he turned it into a, uh, a very wealthy class of people. And that wealthy class of people used their wealth to oppress the poor. And so the, the difference between wealthy and oppressed became even larger. And so the wealthy became wealthier, and the cows of Bashan are the wealthy women who've been using their status and their wealth in order to oppress others, all right? So, um, so the reference seems to do, be to do with the well-to-do women of Israel. Elsewhere, the bulls of Bashan is used, so the women are called upon here. Some 40 years before Amos prophesied, Assyria had beaten, I'm sorry, Assyria had beaten Syria. Uh, with Syria weak, King Jeroboam expanded to the area and created this wealthy merchant class I spoke of. Um, earlier, I had mentioned the above average rainfall, which sustains the region. As part of judgment, God no longer, you know, with the storms and God's control, not only of nations, but of weather. Say, said another way, it's not Mother Nature who controls the, the weather, it's God. He controls the weather to such an extent that whereas they depended on the above average rainfall, God stopped sending it. And the thing is, what's that, what's that going to do to the economy? Ruin. <laughs> Ruin would be a good way to put it. Right? When the economy, when, when the rainwaters dry up, so does the ability to grow crops. 
So does the ability to feed your animals. So does the ability to provide food for the other part of the nation. And when you're not selling your goods and wares to the other part of the nation, you're not getting any money coming in the door, which means you're having to go buy for the things you use to produce, which drains the money even faster. And so the nation goes bankrupt. The things which they had thought would protect them, their 401ks, their money in the bank account, the fat cows that they had, not talking about the women. <laughs> the, the cows were very wonderful to have. They, they, they were talked about being you know, spoken of as being good cows. Everything that they, everything they trusted in is gone. And so God's judgment happens to them. God gave them, um, so again, the, the, and the cities don't receive the rain. Um, what happens when the city don't, don't receive the rain is that the city where the, there are drought, this, those people tend to try to go to other cities, which do. So not only are you draining everything because you're having to essentially dip into savings to buy food, which you used to produce, now they can't get the things done in the city where they lived, so they go to another city, which drains those cities even faster. So it just, it's catastrophic the way to see the way the economy falls in on itself. And that's all by the determined plan and foreknowledge of God. So the people have turned their back on the blessings of God. He in turn withdraws his grace from the land. And yet amongst all this, God calls for repentance. Even though we, he, God is showing his wrath and his anger, he still offers repentance. And that's the same God we have today. A couple of verses are noteworthy. Uh, go down to 4.11. Um, only because it's quoted in the 1700s. He says, I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a log snatched from the fire. That ring true of anybody you know or read about? If you know about them, you're really old. That's, what, that's the verse that John Wesley used to quote when he got saved. He was talking about being a log snatched from the fire, burning ember snatched from the fire. So that's um, verse 411. Four, verse three, chapter 4, verse 13. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to a person what are his thoughts, he who makes dawn into darkness and treads upon the high places of the earth, the Lord of God, Lord God of armies, is his name. Kelly's grandmother, D, used to say this. She says, it's always pitch, it's always darkest just before the dawn, just before it goes pitch black. Always the optimist he was. In this, you see uh, the aspect where the Lord God of, is the Lord God of armies. And he's referring to the coming wrath if there's no repentance. And so what is, what is the dawn? Instead of the dawn breaking into daylight, the dawn just breaks into pitch black. There is no, nothing left if they do not repent. All right, chapter, uh, chapters five through six. Um, this third message um, come, continues the sin. It's a recitation of the sins of Israel, oppression, greed, and corruption, which results in a key for repentance. Again, we read before, but chapter 5, verse 21. Um, I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your festive assemblies. Even though you were offer up me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fattened oxen. Take away from me the noise of your songs, and I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. Such was the worship of Israel that God thought it was a stench in his nostrils. He didn't want a single bit of it because of the hypocrisy of their hearts. But he says this in verse 24, but let justice roll out like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, which really has two different parts to it. Not only is justice going to come because of the wrath of God being fulfilled, but there's actually repentance engaged as well. And when God regenerates us, when we repent of our sins, when we get forgiveness, justice comes out of us as well. Justice will come by either wrath or it'll come by renewal, but justice will come. And so that's why it becomes the, the key verse. Um, and again, you see the same theme echo throughout all of scripture. To obey is better than sacrifice, yes? Okay. All right, so that kind of brings us to the end of, um, of chapter, again, all of chapter four, five, and six are almost the same kind of theme. Chapter seven, eight, and nine. 
uh, are these are these final four visions, five visions of judgment. So in verses one through three of chapter seven, you find the locusts. Let me go back to my overview here. Uh, we looked at the devastation of locusts last week. This devastation at a different time would have been um, at a time when the farmer was planting crops. So, this, so the time we're talking about when Amos is, is really prophesying is when the time the farmer would be planting. This would be the second planting, not the first planting. First planting was so you could feed people. The second planting was so you could feed your your feed your animals. Um, again, when your animals are are no longer when you don't have when this crop is destroyed, you can't feed your animals. When you can't feed your animals, your animals die. They can't feed you. You go looking for money and opportunities someplace else. Other people come looking for you because they don't have anything. And again, the economy begins to collapse all over again. So this would bankrupt the farmers, starving any of the animals they have. Without the animals, not only is there no food for the farmer, but no livestock to plant or no livestock in order to accomplish the planting. You didn't have any animals who could pull a plow for you. Um, you know, no opportunity to cultivate, no opportunity to harvest. And it'd be just a few short years and the whole nation has collapsed. But in verse three of chapter seven, the Lord relented of this. It shall not be, says the Lord. It's not that because God couldn't do this or wouldn't do this. But what you see is Amos begins to pray for the nation. When he says in the middle of verse two, Lord God, please pardon. And God relents. He relents based upon the plea of Amos, not because God or couldn't or shouldn't do what he's going to do, but Amos sees the result of his prayer or his request. The scriptures consistently witness to the possibility that God may choose to do something that he had planned and not do something that he has. Let me rephrase it again. God may choose to do something he had not planned or not do something he had planned in response to the human appeal. And we find this pretty, you find this in Genesis and Numbers and Joshua and Kings in Jeremiah, and Jonah, and Joel. It's a common theme throughout all scripture. Sometimes God doesn't do what he says he's going to do because he changes his mind. And sometimes God does what he says he's not going to do. I mean, God does what he has not said he has intended to do because he's changed his mind. Theologies portray God as, some theologies portray God as inflexible. But God changes his mind as he's always has the ability to do. In verses 4 to 6, uh, real briefly, the Lord was making a plan to consume all the farmland with fire. Not locusts now, but fire. And as we looked at it last week, when we saw the locusts, how they just chewed everything right down to the nubbins. I mean, even to the point of tearing the bark off of trees, that's what locusts would do. But now God sends fire to do that same thing. And again, the Lord relents based upon the plea of Amos. So in verses 7 to 9, of chapter 7. So he showed me, and behold, the Lord was standing by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a plumb line. Well, it was just kind of interesting that, first of all, Amos didn't say, you and the plumb line. Amos kind of gets what the point of this whole thing is. I see the plumb line. And so he, it, the plumb line is meant to is show, uh, as we move on, but behold, I am about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not spare them any longer. And a plumb line is supposed to measure the trueness or correctness of the position of the, the position of the wall and the and the, whether the wall is vertical or not, or there's any angle of the wall. And what he's doing is looking for imperfections. And when the plumb line says this is not square, we can't build upon this. God is going to tear it down. And the purpose of the plumb line is is quite clear. Um, it's God who will measure the nation, and they will be found wanting. There is no appeal in this section, though, by Amos. Only the promise of the measure of the nations, uprightness or righteousness. They've been measured and have been found wanting. All right, in chapters 7, verses 10 to 17, real quickly. Uh, the basket of summer fruit. Again, this is the same format as the plumb line. Amos gets the point here. He sees the basket of summer fruit. And whereas the first two visions of this last set of messages saw God relenting of the plan, here he does not. What started out as a plumb line to measure the nations is here described as being the end of the harvest. The basket of fruit comes at the end of the season. It comes in the harvest time, not the cultivation time or the planting time. 
And it's a sign that the new season is upon us, which means the old season is ending. The season is done. There's no more things to be harvested, no more things to be planted, no more things to be cultivated. It's done. And he's saying, we're, this, this part's over. And so this, this uh, idea of, first of, the, of the fruits of the basket are that God's blessing is over with and done with. We're going to move on to a new season now of winter, if you will. Verse three um, of, let's see, verse three of chapter, yeah, verse three of chapter eight, uh, again, talking about the basket of fruit, um, Israel's captivity. The songs of the palace will turn to wailing on that day, declares the Lord. The corpses will be many in every place and they will throw him them out. Hush. In verse three of the song places the, the palace, the songs of the palace turn to wailing on that day and there'll be corpses. And God's response to this was hush. Now we've looked before that God is a God who speaks and God is a God who hears. And that's true. But in this time when judgment's filled up, when God is, is angry with the nations and his anger is filled to the point where he's ready to stop blessing now and he, he's going to fulfill the part of the covenant, Old Testament covenant, that says we're going to go on with the curses section now. He's not even willing to listen to a single prayer or a single request. He's saying hush. Now, have you ever been told by a parent to shut up? How did you feel at that moment? Tell me your innermost thoughts. <laughs> Depending on how you got told, you knew exactly that you were not to be, your, your parent was not to be trifled with at that moment in time. And that's what's going on here, is God saying, hush. I'm not in, really interested in, in entertaining it anymore. There's a time at which when judgment is being fulfilled, up to that point, there's a time of repentance, which actually stalls it or forestays it. But at some point in time, God will judge all the nations and it will be done. And there's no prayer or anything else that will save you. That's why Hebrews takes the point of saying, today is the day of salvation. Don't miss this opportunity. And in 1 Corinthians 10, these things were written for our instruction. Right? We're not to miss the point of history. God's grace is revealed to us through history and through his commands, and he wants us to repent. But there comes a day in which we don't, he will judge. So again, from, you see the idea from Dan on the way to the north to Beersheba all the way to the south. Again, all of Israel will be judged. God is judging injust, injustice in verses 4 to 8 of chapter 8. And instead of God, who's kind and compassionate, slow to anger, as we see in Exodus 34, we see the full brunt of his anger. The famine of God's words. God stops speaking to the people. Not only does he want the people to stop speaking to him, he stops speaking to the people in chapter 8. There's a famine of God's words, and now even the people look for some hope. God is completely silent. You get the idea, and even as we continue on, just in gloss, glossing over chapter 9, which is saying somewhat the same thing, that God has had it with the people. That's been the point of the whole chapter, the whole, whole book, right? God is ready to be done with it. Um, even the idea of this final oracle in chapter 10, God's standing by the altar. Um, and not just any altar, but the altar of a temple. Now, it's unclear which, which temple, um, but God's standing there, and there's no worship that's supposed to be going on. God doesn't want to hear prayers. God's not interested in speaking to people anymore. And in, in fact, the temple collapses. The pillars get struck so that the threshold shakes and breaks everything down. There are no survivors for anybody who was in the temple at the time. There's no hiding place. God's justice is swift and pervasive, and the nation goes into captivity. The nation's without hope, and they're, wherever they try to escape, even if they could escape, even to Hades, God would find them there. You get the idea that there are dire circumstances surrounding the nation, or about to be, and that's what Amos is prophesying. And yet, even in the last five verses, on that day of verse, chapter 9, verse 11, on that day, I will raise up the fallen shelter of David and wall up its gaps. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. There's a time when God is going to re restore Israel. There's a time when God's going to bring his glory like, all over again. Even the point where he, he takes the nations which have been aligned against Israel itself, and he conquers those nations so that they're all together now under one banner. 
He raises up the fallen shelter, the tent, the dynasty of David. And verse 11 and verse 12, Israel is restored so that the other nations may be included in. God's kingdom is now a kingdom of blessing, not a kingdom of wrath, which is a change from what the rest of Amos was. The tent of David is restored, the nations are included, and even Edom itself. God is that kind of a God who wants to make sure that we have the opportunity to repent. And he gives us every opportunity to do so as we kind of pull this together. God wants faithful men and women. And when we're not faithful, there is a judgment of God coming. Again, this is what the book of Hebrews was all about. There is a time, even though you're part of the family of God, if you will, of a local church, if you're not part of God's family, chosen by him, living for him, there's a time when that judgment will come down and there was nothing that can save you. How shall we escape so great a salvation? The author of Hebrews says. He wants us to be faithful, and yet he will have judgment when we're not. There's also a coming day of judgment for the nations and for the restoration of Israel. And that should give us hope that God is the God who's in control. And what is justice today? We're reminded that um, one last passage, I highlighted so I won't have fun, um, of chapter 5, verse 15. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. This is what God's people should be known for. And if you think about it, when we were looking at the, the armor of God, what was the second part of the armor? Remember? It's a pop, here's my pop quiz for the day. First one was the truth. Second one was the breastplate of what? Righteousness not only exalts a nation, righteousness is what defines, it should define what the God, people of God are. And when we're not, God can rightly ask, are you of me? That's kind of what Amos is leading to. Again, it's a different time and a different age, but we are to be known as people of righteousness. People of faith should be known as people of righteousness. And when we see unrighteousness, when we see things that violate that around us, we should speak up. That's what Amos was doing. That's what he hopes for us to. All right, so um, next week, Okay, Obadiah next week. I'll send around a note this time just to remind everybody. Everybody thought we were doing Joel part two this week. So not everybody, a number of people. So um, again, I've got a little video afterward that you can. I'll play and you can mill around and do whatever. But um, we're going to close in prayer now. And uh, again, thanks for coming. So again, Obadiah next week and let's, let's close in prayer. Again, Father, we thank you for the, the day. We thank you for your character, which gives us goodness. For your character, which has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, the one who has sealed us with your Spirit. And yet, Lord, there are things from Amos we should take away, that we should be people known for righteousness, for justice, for battling oppression. Father, even as we look around our nation and our world, we see these things. Lord, give us strength and give us courage to stand for you. Again, we thank you for your word and the hope that it is to us. Father, we also see that, that for some, it's no hope at all for those who stand against you. Help us deliver that message as well, in faithfulness to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.